morning, good evening, namaskar, welcome. We are in conversation today with Sujaya Mohan Walia, aka Su. Um, the year was 1990 when I first got to meet her in college when she came in as a, a you know, a freshman into the college where I was as a senior. And um, our friendship kind of, you know, resulted and grew into being even colleagues in, in one of our locations where we work together. It's a pleasure to welcome her back after 25 years since I last met her and last spoke with her. It seems she's achieved so many more um, amazing milestones in the journey that she's had since the last time that I had the pleasure of being with her, working with her, getting to know what she was doing in her career between the years 1990 to the year 1996. So with that, it's with immense pleasure I welcome Sujaya Mohanwalia, Sue as she's known in the local circles. Sue, welcome. It's a pleasure. And I'd really love for you to kind of, you know, take a moment to introduce yourself as to how you'd like to be known by our audiences. Go ahead. Thank you, Rajat. It is uh, a pleasure to be on this platform with you today. And like you said, speaking to you after uh, over 20 years. Journey since uh, when we uh, left off uh, has been uh, a myriad of experiences and all beautiful. If you'd like me to begin um, uh, from the time that I, I didn't know you. Yeah. Uh, what uh, better than that when, you know, I get to also know when I didn't know you. Yes. Is, I <laughs> you were 18 or 19 when you walked in into college yes, in the 19. year 1990. Yes. You were 19. So there is a story between... 19 and before 19. So if you don't mind, it'll be a pleasure if you could also expose us to what made Sujaya Mohan, Sujaya Mohan when she walked in through the doors of, you know, where we met for the first time. So I grew up in a, um, an industrial, uh, well, a, a steel plant uh, city of Ranchi, uh, now the capital of Jharkhand. And um, grew up uh, in an environment which was um, a seamless uh, uh, conundrum of English and Indian culture, of uh, Hinduism and Christianity, of uh, Western food and Indian food, um, brought together but my, by my parents who were both from the medical uh, industry and uh, deeply rooted in uh, philanthropy and compassion. And looking back today, I feel a lot of uh, who I am today and uh, the work I do and uh, my passion is driven by um, a lot of fundamentals and foundations that were laid uh, in the environment that I grew up with, uh, with my parents. And um, idyllic childhood, so, so not too much to complain about uh, there. Lucky uh, you. I mean, yes, yeah, yes, I, yes, it awesome. is. It is. Um, coming to uh, hotel management, uh, the choice was actually really simple. I had um, the driving force behind it was something as simple as being able to work through the night. It was one of the first uh, industries that opened up where uh, there was uh, there were night shifts, and for me that was uh, that was something just so different from anything that I had. Uh, plan to do it didn't matter what I was doing uh, it was something as simplistic as that you know the idea of working through a night uh, in an office environment or an organization was just uh, something that uh, said you know I'll figure out what I end up having to do there but uh, that's what drove me and uh, I did have a uh, family saying you know it's a new industry we're not sure so I came to Delhi joined LSR with political science and uh, did a couple of months there till my results came out from IHM and uh, uh, it was a no-brainer. So I just said, that's where I'm going because that's what I'm I decided. I'm going to probe you on that. I'm going to probe you on that. Tell that me. is a very, because you see, back in the 1990s, see, I'm from the, the batch of the 80s. So I, I consider myself still a little ancient, but the 90s had already started seeing uh, a lot of alignment towards going into the airlines, you know, many of our, my batchmates went in there and yours, of course, did. And while hotels was very much glamorous, but there was a desire to get in into more of the airline side. And even corporates had started opening up at that time, BPOs and what have you. But here you are telling me that what interested you 
to come in into hotel management was to explore a lifestyle that gave you the chance to work in an industry that also had an overnight shift. That yes. is something unique. <laughs> Tell me about that. I mean, I've not heard well, it before. You know, you have to understand from, I came from a small town as a, uh, we had a very nice mixed culture around the city, but it was a small town. Uh, and uh, uh, summer holidays for me were spent in Delhi. Uh, so Delhi was distinctly different from whatever it offered to school children, college kids and everything in terms of experiences. And uh, though I wasn't somebody who really wanted uh, that, you know, somebody who the big city lights uh, attracted, but I definitely wanted to explore more and beyond what I thought uh, my city could uh, could uh, offer. And one of the things that uh, in conversation with a neighbor who had uh, joined this course was the, uh, the whole uh, nuances of running an organization um, or a shift uh, uh, through uh, what everybody else would call the uh, the owl hours, you know, the graveyard, graveyard shift, shift other than the janitor, graveyard. nobody else did, yeah. you know, and um, just the the intricacies and the nuances of uh, having a whole uh, a setup, a buzz with life and. Uh, work happening and uh, uh, you know administrating that uh, just seemed uh, like something I'd, I'd enjoy doing you know uh, so I feel off the beaten track has been something that's largely always guided me and thrilled me so uh, this is this is I think where it took me so uh, this is the right point to say that is the reason why we have Sujaya Mohan Walia on the True Grit show the RK show because we are talking about blazing a path that was different it is about the story of an individual that we're going to learn today as to how she was not satisfied with status quo and was exploring uh, different avenues and she in knowing her that I have um, you know would would, would tell me that it is, I reached a plateau and then I'd go do try, try something else. But that's what we're going to explore a lot more. But I really wanted to probe on that point and thank you for answering it as to what motivated you at the age of 19 to consider hotels. And the fact that there was a 24 hour shift possibility, you called it the owl shift. We used to call it the graveyard shift because as a senior lobby manager, I, of course, stopped doing graveyard shifts in, in my stint in the hotels. But there was a time for the first three years doing a night shift for two weeks at a stint. That used to be a killer. And there was a person like you and I, you know, who was interested in that. Very unique, very different. But I think that's what makes you who you are, uh, not accepting the normal. Okay. <laughs> well, you have a whole generation now that uh, that lives like that. Right, right, right. So, Sujaya, great. 19, you arrive, and I remember when you walked in into college because I know I, although I did not, as they used to call it, haze you technically, <laughs> I, I did what any senior would do, which was to get to know who you were. And, you know, I do remember conversations with you. You were very well recognized, um, you know, amongst the various you know, freshmen that had come in at that point in time. Um, I remember used to do fashion shows as well. You used to walk the ramp on whatever we used to organize in the college and what have you. So you were you were a known entity. So there you are, a 19-year-old, and your motivation was clear. You wanted to get in there because you wanted to try something else. But what about that three-year journey led you to a path which you said was a defining moment in your career move right after college? Was there something that you learned there which kind of led you into the path because i believe you went into taj right after college so tell us what happened in college and how did you get into taj and then was that your primary objective were you thinking of something else what is that that journey like so to be honest rajat uh i don't think i had or i even now i i charter out a course for myself uh i am what they call the the cliched free spirit uh, I go where the river takes me, you know. So for me, um, I hadn't thought things through about where I'm going after my three-year course. Uh, so Taj was one of the first interviews I did and uh, I got through all rounds and joined as a management trainee. And uh, uh, I didn't go for any other interviews because uh, I, I had done my industrial training there and loved the chain, loved the people there. So... Uh, 
it it just seamlessly just moved into uh, working with them for five beautiful years uh, in mm-hmm. delhi and one year when uh, i helped them launch the uh, the taj at lucknow uh, which uh, was a beautiful experience and that's where i came back and met you and we launched the the executive floors at taj uh, but somewhere like i said the free spirit in me uh, didn't really see myself doing uh, doing working with the hotels uh, endlessly and uh, which is why i just had 5 years there and then moved uh, moved from there into something really different. and before we get out of uh, before we get out of your journey yes. there and listen you 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 know we of course worked together you know in in the year 1996 when we launched the club and dbr flow together we brought in if we may say uh the first of the corporate clients of sorts into taj palace which still then was a group hotel which still then was more into getting you know travelers coming in taj man singh or you know the taj mahal hotel in delhi was more corporate client aligned whereas taj palace where you and i kind of used to work was more of a group hotel till that point or a convention hotel and we could proudly say you and i and of course karambir kang you know god bless him he's now in the new york in in boston and he's over here in the us but i remember uh, karambir and i going ahead and trying to bring in some clientele uh, you know from the embassies and also from bombardier and uh, the others and you used to handle the floors as the as the supervisor the manager uh, you know together and we we set up something really beautiful over there but you mentioned about taj lucknow as well vipin khand gomti nagar and that must have been an awesome experience because i know that hotel very well as well and uh, so you've actually had experience as a startup because you went into a startup of sorts so you know where i'm going with this is your experience with running a startup or setting up a startup did not happen in your later journey i think in the early 90s itself you had a good opportunity yes. to be there and we want to talk a little bit about that startup aspect of it because i think i want to explore that later in your conversation so rightly uh, like you've said rajat uh, that opportunity uh, came along because they were opening the hotel and because uh, i was a completely hands on operational person uh, and had uh, worked uh, uh, in in front office uh, for a while with them uh, so they had put together a team to go and set up the uh, the front operations and the room operations for that hotel and i was uh, very happy to uh, to explore that because it gave me an avenue as an operations person to look at like you've said uh, a whole startup and the nuances that come with that i think that experience what it did do is uh, for me teach i mean you know remove any um, uh, averseness to risk uh, any averseness to jumping in at the deep end and just taking things on uh, it definitely hone skills about working with uh, a multitude of people in um, in a completely new environment uh, uh, the team there was unknown uh, the city was unknown uh and uh, so i think it did it did bring about uh, a whole new set of experiences a whole new set of skills that uh, i have then used in uh, all the various professions that i have had yes, yes, uh, yes. yeah see i don't know if I, i i ever did your formal appraisal at that time to tell you what i think and thought about you at that time i have to say this on record today one of the most calm composed well situated individuals that i had the pleasure of working with you were very well recognized for the way you kind of managed handled your relationships with your guests your clients that used to stay with us were impeccable and i believe that may have helped you with the next career move in your life right after taj so tell us how you suddenly said i'm successful i was a management trainee i launched a new hotel i was doing exceedingly well at taj palace you were well recognized sujaya but you decided to give it up and to get into something else what was that what what drove you to that and where was that uh so like you rightly said it was uh, one of our very regular uh, clients that at taj that did uh, offer me a job in a whole new industry of hr and training and like i said there is 
there is a restless aspect a huge restless aspect to to me and my personality and uh, when that came along it didn't take me a second to uh, think about it or uh, um, you know i know my uh, personal manager mr prabhakar singh was shocked when he said you know in the middle of what you're doing and where you're going with us you you want to give it all up and um, uh, maybe naivety and maybe uh, immaturity but i was quite sure that i i am somebody who wants to explore uh, above and beyond it's so strange you mentioned prabhakar singh after 25 years because when i decided to go join pizza hut and kfc with niren and set up that and i left the taj a little before you did prabhakar was the guy who had to kind of you know uh, do my my parting honors as we call it and he was like he used a word in hindi a sentence in hindi abhi to tumko laaye the ट्री <laughs> 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 Uh, gives you such a solid foundation in right. uh, in who you are and your skills and your uh, work True. etiquette and your everything that uh, you feel you're ready to launch into something something more Very and true. unfortunately for me it wasn't within the industry but uh, that's who i am and i think uh, but you yeah. five years built you well i think your five years and your personality yes, and the absolutely. way Absolutely. It built you well. So talk to us about that because that was that HR uh, aspect of it, uh, you know. And quickly, and thereafter, you went into something even more interesting around dealing with women and child welfare, and you know, th- these are very, very unique, disconnected, yet connected. So I, I'd like our audiences to understand that while you took on unique roles, and they may look disconnected on the top, there was a little connection in it. and your personality was kind of suited for that kind of a, a kind of exploration that you were doing talk to us about the hr role and talk to us about the next one so i think uh, as distinctive as they were i did work in hr and training i think for close to 6 uh, years with a firm uh, based out of uk and they were setting up uh, hr and training uh, establishments in india so i set up their delhi office and then helped with their uh, bombay and bangalore business and largely within the uh, the fmcg companies and uh, so i worked with the biggest names in the corporate sector from cadbury to coca cola to heinz to hll uh, it was an extension of the skills that i had developed the uh, the core um, professionalism that i had developed at the taj uh, and that is a great learning ground um i then moved uh, on from there uh, to something very different with uh, another another startup uh, fountainhead solutions where who did corporate communications in the development sector and uh, that was purely uh, by chance because it there was somebody i knew who set up the company and uh, asked me if i would come in and the challenge there that excited me was that it was so different from everything i had done in the corporate world that uh, it would have it did mean a whole new set of skills a whole new set of learning uh, and uh, i think that's what excited me um, because i think i had explored what i felt i needed to and had learned from the corporate sector and i moved into uh, business development and corporate communications I think and you're eventually- underplaying it i i think you're underplaying your own you know you you're calling it you know see the the unique thing is that and you said it before accepting status quo and living with yeah. you know what's been established was not something that that made you happy you you tried it you did it well you did something at in hotels you did it well in the hr profession you went in into corporate communications where i'm trying to get this together is that somewhere in you there was that desire in you to say can i kick it a notch and can i explore something else was that something that you intrinsically had was that family driven 
what is the motivation as to how did you have that uh, uh, i wouldn't say family driven my dad's a doctor and has practiced medicine all his life uh, still does god bless him uh, i think for me the uh, uh, the motivation behind that really is uh, uh, you know a taking up a new challenge but definitely exploring a new environment so for Beautiful. me it always was a new set of people a new uh, industry uh, a new skill set you know as uh, divergent as it could be from what i was already doing Beautiful. and largely from the hotels to uh, to hr and training it still was very service oriented it still was very people oriented uh and uh, uh, but the audience suddenly changed when i moved uh, to the development sector i worked with who usaid the ministries in uh, women and child and uh, just government uh, meetings at government offices and government liaisoning was just a whole new ball game for me my my hindi at the best of times is uh, uh, what i would say gender neutral so it used to be quite disastrous and there were times when they have actually uh, called the office and said you know is madam ko nahi bhejo because she doesn't quite get what we are trying to say <laughs> especially when they are trying to you know so Uh, so it it was an amazing uh, experience for huge me huge learning for you huge learning for you yes. from huge the corporate learning and yeah. yes the comfort of being in you know the corporate world where you speak the language you know the people you are intuitive to what they are going to say this was something completely different and uh, uh, i loved it i loved it for as challenging as it was and as uh, frustrating as it could get because of my uh, Uh, lack of skills to be able to deal with it uh, it was a huge uh, a huge learning for me and uh, we moved on thankfully that the company grew really fast and they moved into events so i started doing events again back to uh, the corporate sector uh, a little bit because that's where my forte was that's uh, that's what i knew best uh, uh, but um, but that that again like i said fueled uh, Uh, my need for something Beautiful. different something something so, challenging women welfare and child development you know how did that align with did that happen accidentally or you know was there already something that 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 you were evaluating that you wanted to get into public service or what was that motivation actually i wouldn't say that it was something that uh, i chose it happened because oh. uh, Uh, yeah it happened largely because of uh, the organization that i was working with and their uh, their forte was uh, uh, public health and uh, women and child issues oh, and okay. uh, and they did a lot of the aids work for usaid for who at that time because that's what that was the big uh, thing going on then so all the advocacy documents for them all the collaterals that were developed um, but uh, for me uh, health wellness uh, has always been an intrinsic part of my life with my parents both being from the uh, from the medical industry uh, so somewhere i feel that uh, that intuitiveness that compassion um, is ingrained and and helped me understand uh, uh, situations or uh, needs i that- could get the empathy factor in a lot more easier comparatively because you had seen your parents both being doctors yeah. uh, you know treating patients and you know it kind of somewhere flows in into you you all you've also been a great um, you know very successful at working with and communicating with people as a part of your hotel experience and so therefore armed with empathy and armed with good communication the only limitation being hindi and the ability to communicate in hindi when being with a, a governmental organization and i'm not going to kid you on your hindi because we've had some conversations back yeah. in college as well it's so a shame because i i have grown up uh, lived all my life in this country and uh, but it is because i think because of my mom we spoke english at home more than we spoke hindi and so i grew up with that as my my yes. thought language so right. so it um, yeah so and it's it, a great experience it's, it's nothing to be this is life this is how we are that's what defines us 
Yeah. So but, my uh, mother's not a doctor. She's a radiographer, actually. And I will come back to that in uh, later. But uh, yes, I think a large part of them having uh, that understanding, that empathy, dealing with, with people, uh, you know, uh, flows through, through me. Uh, so so that, uh, again, became a very uh, a natural fit uh, in in that area and space when I worked. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, the true grit side of you comes out today. Today, you're an entrepreneur. And the, 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 the work that you do is in a very unique field. My question to you is, what led you to Yogi's Kettle? What led you to exploring herbs and spices? What led you to holistic healing? Because you kind of, if you look at I can see the doctor side of it. I can see the radiographer side of it and all that influence. But something game-changing must have happened. What is the game-changing situation? So all through my uh, my life, I have always believed in natural living. I have uh, always intrinsically believed that uh, nature has all the tonic that a human body needs for radiant health. And uh, it's something I've practiced right through school years, pottering around in my mom's kitchen, through college, uh, post that, you know, uh, spending a lot of time with, you know, herbs, plants, leaves, shoots, flowers, and creating stuff that I feel works for normal common illnesses out of sheer interest. Uh, we live in India. So you are the Kada girl. You are the one who believes in Kadas and you're the Kada. one who believes yes, in... Yes, ask and my I... kids. They will tell you. <laughs> and yeah, you and know, we, yeah. we belong to a country uh, which is the home of Ayurveda, which is the home of some of the most traditional form of uh, natural healing. True. And uh, uh, so as, as distinctive it is, as it is from everything my father does from allopathy, I grew up on allopathic medicines, but uh, along every allopathic medicine I had, I know I did a little bit of my own mambo jambo in a glass and did my own stuff. So the interest has been there. The, the belief in uh, the fact that, uh, you know, nature allows you to participate in your own health uh, in the most easy way possible. Uh, and that is something that is the bedrock of what I do today, that, uh, you know, your your uh, awareness of your body uh, as a part of the whole, which is nature, uh, is actually the key to, to keeping you in equilibrium, keeping you in good health. And that's that's what I use in, um, in the work that I do. Uh, saying that, yes, uh, I did have a... a a whole episode of uh, ill health uh, in 2013 with myself and uh, went through traditional forms of uh, treatment for for cancer we were lucky it was caught uh, early uh, and uh, i think the fact that i had done so much in any case in terms of learning and studying it just seemed to me that uh, the universe had presented itself with an opportunity for me to experiment with what i knew and put it out there and uh, uh, and that's what i did you know i um, helped supplement uh, conventional treatment with what i was doing and uh, and it worked and on all levels just not just uh, medication but uh, mental emotional uh, holistic healing and then on uh, i think what naturally happened from there because uh, i felt so good about uh, how what i was doing for myself right through treatment and post that that uh, i knew that it needs to get out to a lot more uh, women going through what i had gone through and uh, so immediately after uh, I was well enough, I uh, went back to the hospital that I was uh, treated at and uh, started working with the doctors there. When I mean supplementing here, uh, I wasn't taking anything in. I wasn't eating anything. Uh, I was probably having karas, but uh, a lot of it was to do with more emotional and mental uh, space because I believe uh, healing starts uh, for your body. <clears throat> 
on a uh, on a foundation where you need to change the environment in your body and you know from for me the the medical community was doing what they needed to do in terms of the medicines i did what i needed to do to make sure that my body was in the best state to receive the medicines for them to Beautiful. do what they needed to do Beautiful. and uh, it took yoga it took meditation it took uh, you know uh, a lot of uh, music therapy a lot of uh, uh, happy game therapy a, a lot of stuff that i felt just supplemented uh, uh what they were doing and uh, so from there flowed naturally the uh, both suz yogi kettle and on my terms which is the platform that i use uh, for women undergoing uh, cancer um so yogi kettle is the physical um, as we call it product Yes, uh, yes you know which which is offered which is and you'll talk about it a little bit more because i'm very intrigued on the spice yes. healing side yes. of it i'm deeply intrigued yes. and on the the use of herbal supplements or herbal natural remedies as we call it so that's the physical product side of it and then there is the more you know healing through readying your mental status which is probably yoga driven healing driven etc so that is that side in what is that the name that you just took what is the name of that and on my terms so it's on it's a platform term. yes uh, yeah it's a platform that i started uh, largely first providing uh, hair pieces or uh, actually uh, beanies for uh, women who lost their hair during chemotherapy and uh, from there uh, oh. it organically it organically um, grew that i started helping them with advice yeah. on uh, what to eat and you know uh, how to keep your head in the right space because that yeah. was most important and uh, so that's the platform that i use where i do uh, workshops in uh, at medanta here in uh, in gurgaon uh, for oncology patients largely breast cancer patients and uh, suz yogi kettle on the other hand was an amalgamation of uh, my love for alchemy and my love for all things natural and I my love it. alchemy love yes. it <laughs> and my belief that uh, our ancestors uh, you know responded to the 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 chemistry of botanicals in the way they did and the way they they knew for centuries and uh, beautiful uh, that's that's what we need to go back to because our bodies do respond to nature you know to the chemistry of what i'm going to ask you something i'm going to interrupt medanta is naresh trehan yes. you know medanta is is set up by a gentleman who has been known in india of course in delhi he was known since escort days and what have you he's a traditional you know doctor i mean i don't know him personally he probably knows you but was that easy to go ahead and say mr trehan in your setup medanta which is one of the largest hospitals in gurgaon possibly in india it's like a you know it's a, it's, a, it's a complete city over there it's a complete city you walk up and you say i'm going to start doing this and was it like open welcome here the doors are open for you just come in or how so was that so i was i was lucky uh, that i had uh, both my surgeon and my onco head who's the uh, the head of the cancer department uh, dr ashok bed uh, were uh, were people who were open minded uh, as far as supplementing therapy goes uh, the the industry still is quite closed about uh, supplementing with other uh, ingestibles uh, whether it's ayurveda or anything else uh, and that uh, i don't blame them because one way or the other both practitioners of ayurveda or practitioners of chinese uh, herbal medicine traditional medicine or allopathy don't study each other and uh, where what you don't know you cannot put your faith into so it is it, in all fairness i i completely understand when uh, they tell you during chemotherapy don't drink wheat grass because we don't know how it works you know so i believe in that and that's what i follow during allopathic uh, treatment i don't allow any of my clients or patients to uh, uh, to supplement with anything that they need to ingest the choices they make thereafter are theirs to do based on studies that right. they do for themselves but at that point you're only working with the mentality side of it the you're working with the emotional body you're emotional working with the metaphysical body. you're working with uh, them understanding that there is basically there is hope and there is Beautiful. always hope till 
like I say, till the na last nail in your coffin is put in, there is hope Beautiful. and you Beautiful. need to hold on to the hope. Beautiful. So, um, yeah, so coming back to uh, Sue's Yogi Kettle, uh, it was actually I, sitting across a cup of one of my brews with my husband in my kitchen uh, that uh, he said, you know, just put it into a bottle, you know, the the spirit behind it, the thought behind it, the, the love behind the creation. And that's what we did. We came up with a name, we put it in a, a bottle. Came what up was that brew? What was that brew that kind of got it going? What was that, that was that was immunity boost, actually. Uh, no, actually, yes, it was immunity boost because uh, this was uh, same time, December, Jan. And uh, Delhi winters are harsh. And uh, I had sat and put together and I have an older son who has uh, whose respiratory system doesn't like Delhi. Um, so he used to get his perpetual cold cough and sneezing during that season. So I, I did this, I do this karha for him uh, every winter. And uh, that's what we were sipping. And I said, you know, everybody in the family just has to have it. And that's what we were sipping. And he says, you know, this is so good. We enjoy this. And uh, I feel it does work in, you know, uh, keeping things off for us. Just put it in. And uh, I think a day before I had uh, I'd done a rose petal infusion for some friends who came over and um, uh, he is a complete uh, hardcore Indian chai guy and uh, he turned around and said, my God, I would have never thought of myself uh, to have been able to drink and enjoy something which is just water and things floating in it and and no sugar and no uh, tea leaves and no milk beautiful and uh, so my first brew actually was named after him it was called ananda and that friend of mine is called anand and um, uh, that actually beautiful. started and catapulted in saying that you know if i can get people to uh, to understand and to take responsibility and to take charge and to participate in their own health in such a delicious way, it uh, it would just be beautiful. So, so if should one see you as a person with test tubes and kind of mixing things up or somebody with a kettle boiling water and mixing yes, things and then yes. pouring it and holding it, how yes. do they see Sue's Yogi kettle in its inception? You know, a little bit of let me try a little bit of ginger and let me throw in a little bit of uh, telecherry yes. black pepper and let me add a bit of uh, you know um, you know whatever the combinations that you came up with was that your studies that taught you there or was it hit and miss and trial what how did that happen so each blend actually came to fulfill a need that somebody in my circle uh, brought to me uh, whether it was uh, cold coughs, whether it was uh, stiff bodies, whether it was uh, low immunity, whether it was sleep issues, uh, whether it was just sheer vanity where they felt, you know, they needed something for their hair and skin. And so each 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 blend actually grew from from a need or from a requirement uh, really? from a friend. And uh, the blends itself were uh, the essence of them was supposed to be they were supposed to be huge on taste because my idea is I don't want you you will not enjoy sipping a kara unless you are sick so it has to be something that gives you the kick gives you the uh, you know invigorates you and you just want to reach out and have Thank another you. one of those drinks like you'd reach out to a tea or a coffee um, so so the idea was that it has to be really big on on taste and um, because we don't use, they're completely caffeine free. We don't use any tea leaves in it. Uh, I had to rely on, uh, you know, uh, foundations of stronger herbs, like whether it was spearmint or uh, hibiscus or, or ginger to create base tones for it. Uh, and then build in the um, the factors that brought in the, uh, the health uh, aspect. To so the there is a manufacturing unit. And if I were to walk in there, I would get to see... Uh, a, a rigorous process of how this is blended together and you know it's either a potion uh, or it is a it's a it's a powder or it is some kind of a, um you know um, something that can be added to your 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 morning breakfast or something like that that one would get to see how how does one visualize what gets out of Sue's yogi kettle so our blends are largely mixed combinations of herbs, roots, spices, 
all in their truest natural form. So they will be herbs that have been harvested naturally, dried naturally as far as possible. And uh, uh, I would say hand constructed. So they'd be hand crushed or hand cut. Mortar and pestle. We are talking yeah. about a mortar and pestle. We are yes. talking about the very traditional ways in which you actually grind yes, it. Because into the idea behind it is that the the essence of any herb uh, deteriorates over time. You know, once it's it's stored, and the longer I take in a in a non natural process to process and the herb to put it into a bottle for you, the lower the potency of what I'm giving you is. So we blend fresh. Uh, we use uh, season to season harvested herbs in our teas. Uh, we don't stock on shelves at all because uh, herbs are delicate. Uh, spices are a little sturdier, but herbs are delicate and sunlight, moisture, everything affect. Uh, so affects this them. is this is not this is actually requested for. This isn't like we used to call it in the hotel parlance. This isn't a buffet. This is a la carte. It's, yes, it's prepared yes. for you. It, it is it is a la carte because we blend fresh. You place your orders. We have a whole array of stuff out there. You place your orders. We will blend fresh and send you. So yeah, turnaround time is two to Beautiful. three days. Beautiful. So uh, so that that's uh, where Sue's Yogi Kettle really came into uh, into being, and um, we sell them as recreational tisans. Uh, because the idea is for it to become such an intrinsic part of your everyday hydration that it's not looked at as a as a medicine or something that you're having to do when you are feeling ill at ease or where there is a, a virus looming large. You know, it's it's when it's something that you do as as a scheduled everyday routine, as as easy as you reach out. So I have a whole set of people who say now you you know you got us off our morning cup of tea and we can never go back to that. And I miss it, but I will never go back to it because I, I enjoy something which uh, is as as delicious for my morning cup. So that that's where we want people to come that, you know, enjoy. I enjoy my coffees, but enjoy your hydration through the day. But make sure, uh, you know, one or, or two or three cups of it are uh, giving you a lot more punch, a lot more bang for your buck in so that cup. Here in the U.S., you know, it, health is, you know, kind of supplements and health products is a very big industry and now you in fact see they talk about you know getting a cup at home already 20 cups or 30 cups that come in it already has scale inside it it already has beetroot in it and it has strawberry in it and it's got all of that and there's another little thing along with it which has some of the more you know root roots that are supposedly helpful, ginger, et cetera, et cetera. And they tell you what to mix in, put it inside a Nutri blender, blend it in and take it on. I don't know if that is going to, it's going to be something that will continue, but is that something you're seeing in India as well? And do you see this becoming more mainstream or is this that it's just going to be just those diehard uh, people who, who understand the value of it, who will get behind it? But, or do you see this becoming an industry of sorts? It's interesting that you say that, you know, when, when I started uh, and I launched the brand now uh, four, year, four and a half years ago, uh, there is, there's been a huge shift uh, and naturally so to, uh, to health in the last decade, really. And in, uh, in, in the younger generation, you know, and that's where health, uh, taking onus of your health really should begin, you know. Uh, I think our generation went through taking uh, our bodies uh, for granted when we were growing up, saying that, you know, we are young and youthful and this is how it stays. And till you get to your later years and you realize that uh, you maybe need to, needed to have invested a little more uh, awareness into what you were doing earlier on, you know. So I'm not saying we're talking about abuse to the body here, but just in terms of what you could have done on a daily basis to rest your body enough, to put in more natural product, to put in more local product, to put in more uh, um, non-packaged product. And uh, so there is that huge shift in awareness in uh, in the younger generation now, in the younger population, which is um, which is two things. Which is one is reducing carbon footprint, so they automatically move away from packet stuff, processed stuff. 
and to the fact that uh, they are going back to uh, some of their roots to more natural living you know and realizing that we have Beautiful. to peak when it comes to uh, uh, processed lives and they are going back to uh, to a little more of simplicity so i think um, definitely my clientele is starts at 18 and goes all the way up till uh, 65 70 Beautiful. You know? Uh, when I launched uh, Sleep Easy, which is one of my um, uh, teas that helps you have more restful, deeper sleep, I thought it would be the the 45s and above that would be my largest clientele. And lo and behold, it was uh, 20 year old saying, "I'm stressed, I can't sleep, exams, work pressure," and uh, they are the largest chunk of the people having uh, sleep disorders and using things like that. But the beauty is that. They are aware, you know, and they're reaching out to natural products. They are understanding uh, why that disorder is happening that early in life. I never remember my father ever saying, I'm so stressed, I haven't been able to sleep. Uh, you know, and it's not that their lives uh, didn't have stress. Their lives had stress as much as ours do. But we tend to take on a lot more. We are bombarded with a lot more. We... Um, we react a lot more, you know, True. to things. So, uh, so I think in that definitely, uh, uh, when you were talking about kale and things in a glass, uh, I do feel for a lot of natural living. Uh, one of the things that I have learned over the years is uh, is the awareness that goes into what you're doing, uh, you know. So, which is why uh, I don't uh, put my teas are not ground in a powder in a in a tea bag that you just mindlessly dip into a cup. It comes in a jar or a tin where you have to spoon it out, put it into a cup, watch it blend, watch it brew. Because I feel the whole experience of uh, what you're doing, you know, um, Beautiful. you know, when you when you've made when you've done it like that and you take your first few uh whiffs of your your tea or your tisane whatever it may be yeah, it's, uh, it's your senses tuning into the energy of the botanicals yeah. in your cup you know and that's yeah. where it starts reacting with the chemistry of your body and working for you you know and that's yeah. how every bit of uh, food hydration should happen for humans you know it's because we do so much of it mindlessly uh, you know, you can even do eat a burger with awareness and it will be good for you. But if you eat it the way we eat it on the go, on the run, uh, there is a lot of uh, disconnect between what you're putting into your body. And that I feel is is what we need to get back to. Mindfulness. You're talking about mindfulness. We talk about it called as being in the moment. Yeah. I think being in the moment is just not being in the moment like you and I are in the moment right now in a conversation. I think being in the moment is even as you're saying while eating food, because then you are. And I, 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 I have an individual in my own life, and they call her my wife. She keeps telling me the same thing. If you're eating something, spend some time focusing on it. Eat as if you're eating for the value of what you're getting out of it, and not that you're shoving in something in. So I think where you're going is exactly it. That what you're doing has to have that presence yes. and you have to make that moment count because then it adds the value. And this is not something that modern, you know, people from our generation, I think this is where our grandmothers would have said that. Yes. Yes. This is where our, our ancestors would have said that. And I, I think this comes down from that deep rooted belief yeah. that you have to be connected to what you're doing there it's not new it's it's uh, it's wisdom that's come down from the ages it's just that uh, in the uh, in the rush to do so much that there is to do today uh, and to to make sure that we are not missing out on the opportunities that we feel life presents you you try and pack in a lot more than you should be doing into your everyday so that's where I feel, you know, that if you're if you're having a cup of SYK tisane, you make it a ritual, you know, you make it count, even if it, it takes all of five minutes in your day, you know, to heat water, brew, put a teaspoon in, watch it uh, do its wonders in the cup and then uh, watch it do its wonders as you sip it into your body. So it is it is make make things ritualistic you know even getting ready uh, driving you know make them ritualistic so that you are being able to uh, 
go in the flow of the moment uh, and bring the calmness because I feel a lot of what we've all uh, felt in the last three years with being locked down is that we've all had a sense of uh, forced calmness on us because we've not had places to rush to, uh, you know, and in as harsh as it has been uh, from the health point of view and the losses, I think it has also been a huge uh, opportunity for people to go back to uh, uh, being with themselves, you know, being with family, being in the moment, uh, being cooped up in in four rooms and not having places to go to. And, and not being home. dependent on just your device, at least talking to people yes, and yes. forming the connections again. Yes. So I think uh, there is a huge uh, blessing aspect of our situation right now as well. And if we all are to to bring out uh, or to, to come out of it wiser, I think that's one of the learnings and one of the takeaways that uh, we should all have. So listen, it's been, see, your journey has been a true great journey. You know, an individual very accomplished for what we went to college for and what you did and how you kind of, you know, took your career and never satisfied with what was in front of you. You did it, you did it well, and then you wanted to go try something else. And something significant happens in your life and that changes the way you look at life itself. I don't think you had a business idea at that time that I'm going to do this, but your personal situation and your belief that you could also help your own situation out with a healing and support from what our natural remedies gave us, what our, you know, the ability to calm our mind and through yoga and through the other things that the Indian system allows us, that kind of led you to something which you are now passionate about and you're doing. And I know, you know, there's more to talk to you about it. And I know we've spent over close to 40 minutes here, 45 minutes, but this journey doesn't end here because I, I see you coming on to a conversation with me with a cancer specialist that I have in mind whom I'd like to talk with because he has a view of how he wants to change the world because he thinks that every cancer that is operatable or treatable should be treated and no life should be lost just because uh, people didn't have access to healthcare or there was anything else holding them back. I also believe somebody who wants to talk about how healthcare in India should change. And that's another individual. And I see that's the kind of combination I'd like to bring you back on and also see how the yeah, kind of exactly. thing that you're talking about helps them in their agendas. Because they may come from the view of traditional allopathic medicine. And is there an openness to see that this is not replacing it? This is supporting it. This is adding a little bit more of calmness and happiness quotient to an individual going through a very tough process in their personal lives. I think these are the things that I'd like to explore with you going forward, Sujaya. But as we come to the conclusion of this episode, if you look back on your journey of, and I'm not going to put an age on it, because you're still not beyond 23 that I last left you at, um, what is it that you, you, you think you could have done more of or you should have done uh, better off or you should have done less off. I'm not going to say regrets, more off, better off or less. Off. I think uh, more of traveling for sure, uh, especially now when we haven't been able to for three years. Um, maybe little uh, less procrastination and, uh, you know, um, Jumping into things as and when they came, I think I have already done. So uh, no, no regrets. No regrets. No regrets. And you're seeing that the future ahead of you is is full of calmness, full of beauty, full of, you know, helping people out who have the requirement but don't know how to go about it. And that's something that's motivating you, right? Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Any parting last minute thoughts from you before we close the episode today? I think, uh, no, it's, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. And I think this platform itself uh, uh, is, a, is a brilliant idea, you know, to bring uh, uh, multi-faceted uh, people on board and to bring their stories out. Uh, because I feel every story has... Uh, 
impacts that it can have on other lives, you know, uh, and uh, all the best to you. Uh, and thank you so much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure, Sajaya. I'm so proud of you. It's such a pleasure getting to know you after 25 years again, rediscovering as we call it. And uh, I couldn't be more delighted. So with that, we'll, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, we'll sign off for this evening. Shubhratri, you know, good day. Shabha khair. We'll catch up again on another episode with another very good friend of mine whose story we'll explore and we'll bring back Sujaya again for another conversation.